Before we dive into the exciting process of constructing a system model, we should actually understand exactly the requirements for us to really model about, right? Why don't we spend the time, uh, maybe a few minutes, to uh, actually understanding about what the requirements are in order for us to really construct a model. Let's now take a look. And what we're gonna model about for this uh, tutorial is going to be a bank system. A very simple one, not to be complicated, just for the purpose of the lab. And of course, you might decide to actually, for your your own exercise, to really extend the functionality of the bank uh, at your own uh, free time, if you want to. And let's now take a look. Uh, you, you, uh, you can also refer to your lab manual PDF, uh, the lab instruction. In the problem uh, section over there, you we actually talk about two kinds of a description you can put in a requirements document. So whenever we talk about requirements documents, this is the place where you actually want to specify exactly what you really want in order to really uh, in order for the system in being uh, implemented to really satisfy. And there are two kinds of a uh, description over here. Let's now go over one by one. And the first kind is called environmental constraint or the E description. Let me show to you exactly how to look at them over here. The green one over here is the uh, E description, so called over here. So you can see here we got environments over here, EMV, standing for env uh, environments, okay. And we got one, we got two, and we got three. They are usually indexed by the number starting from one. And each one of them will actually state a certain environmental constraints or assumption. We'll definitely see more and more examples throughout the course. But for this particular tutorial, let's now consider the uh, let's now consider the following assumptions or e descriptions. Right? They are called e description over here. And there's another thing that's very important for you to remember. Typically, any constraint you talk about in terms of the e description, they are simply just the working environments we are we have to deal with. Meaning that this beyond our control is simply something to be assumed without having to prove. Mathematically, it will be declared as axioms when we talk about the rodent tool. That's something you want to keep in mind. All right. Let me say that again. Whenever we talk about environmental constraint, typically the constraint themselves are beyond our control as a system modeler. In that case, we should actually, when we construct our model, to really reflect those E descriptions as axioms in our model so that we can use uh, those axioms to really discharge or to prove other theorems, which will be described using the other kind of description, which are called the R descriptions, right? That's something you want to remember. Before we get to the R descriptions, the other kind, let's not just go over uh, the, what, the e descriptions, uh, what the E descriptions are for our bank system. The first one, the, uh, let me make it a little bit larger for you. Uh, just make it uh, be a little bit nicer to you. All right. It's uh, a bank system is concerned with accounts, right? So this is really ta talking about the environments that we have to deal with, right? So we talk about accounts. That's something we have to assume. Uh, there might be a certain set of accounts uh, for which we have to deal with for the uh, for the bank. What well, we'll get there. And also an account has a numerical balance denoting the money in it, right? And let me now put it here, uh, a numerical balance over here, right? And when we talk about numerical, if you can recall from your math review lecture, what kind of a numerical types have we uh, discussed so far? It can be either integer, would just be Z, or it can be a natural number, simply N. We will see another special kind of a natural number, which will be, uh, it's called natural number one, with a one. Uh, subscript, meaning that, well, remember natural number start with zero, but M1 over here obviously will start with one instead. Sometimes you might find this one more useful than this. It, it depends, right? But anyway, so when we say numerical balance, now we got three different options over here. Choosing one of them would be a modeling decision that we should be able to justify. We'll get to that, uh, we'll get to that point when we get there, uh, when we construct the model. All right, and also the third one over here, an accounts balance must be greater than a credit limits and less than a preset upper bound, right? That's also something we have to make sure it's incorporated into our model. Let me just highlight it over here. It must be uh, greater than a uh, credit limits over here. That's one thing. And also a preset upper bound, right? Let me just uh, give you a little bit look ahead. So what we're gonna do eventually a credit limits, we're gonna use a C over here, some constant. And preset upper bound, we'll say maybe uh, L over here. Okay, these two characters over here. 
C and L. And whenever we talk about balance, well, let's just say, for example, let's say, for example, C happens to be 100, meaning that for any account, the credits can go, uh, the balance can go below, but no more than the actual credit limits. For example, that would be minus 100. Okay, so you can your your balance can go below zero, but only to the extent that your credit limit can support. In this case, credit limit will be one hundred, so that means you can go up to, but uh, you can go down to and including uh, minus one hundred, but you cannot go down to maybe minus one hundred five. It's not acceptable. All right. So for any balance over here, so think about the balance. The lower bound will be minus the credit limits and the upper limits, which will be L. For example, L could be maybe 500. Well, let's say, let's say each account cannot really go uh, exceeding, uh, let's say five, $500. In that case, it would be 500. Let's say that's uh, our uh, constraint. However, the one I'm looking, uh, I'm considering right now, this is only a particular example, right? This is only one instance. And if you think about programming, of course, you can definitely instantiate C to be 100 and also L to be 500 and try to test. Maybe you can write some genuine test cases, assertions to really test for this particular uh, C and L combination. It's definitely doable. However, what we're doing now is so-called formal methods. And you want to really make sure you understand this uh, distinction over here. In this lab, we also want to distinguish between modeling versus programming. So you can look at the C over here and also the L over here. And we're going to show to you, rather than being so specific about what C and L should be, for example, 100 for, uh, and also 500, we should be able to manipulate them, okay? So what we're gonna talk about formal method, FM, which uh, you actually uh, got introduced to in your uh, lecture 1A, right, in week number one. So the formal method that we're gonna do is, we're going to prove properties holding on all possible combinations of C and L, these two numbers. So these two numbers will somehow be numerical and as, uh, as long as we can really use the road and prover to actually prove properties, those properties must hold on all the possible values, definitely including minus 100 and also 500. And if you think about how valuable this is, we don't really have to write maybe a million different test cases to test uh, the different combinations between uh, you know, the uh, credit limits and also upper bound. All we got to do is to really manipulate uh, these two variables based on their typing constraint and then at the abstract level, and the prover can actually do this for us. That's something you'll definitely see. Please keep this in mind, all right? All right, so those, that's about the environmental constraint, and some of them will be turned into axioms uh, that will be assumed to be true without having to prove. That's something you will see when I construct the model. Let's now talk about the second category of a description for, your, uh, for our requirements document for the bank, right? The second category over here has the REQ. Uh, prefix. Let me highlight it over here. REQ over here. And REQ over here obviously stands for requirements. Right? And then they're also indexed. So we simply got the, the number, uh, we simply got the number continuing from the E description. So we can really index about which uh, description you're talking about. Right? So you can see so there's also index. Four, five, six, seven, and eight. Right. Oh, one more thing I want to say about the e-description. The way for you to really present uh, each description is you got to say whether or not it is environment constrained or it is a requirement for the software to satisfy either EMV or REQ. You have to make a decision and then you got to give a number, of course, that'll be the uh, ingredients. And then you're going to give some informal description, even though it's informal, but you want your English language to be written in a more like a concise and precise way. That will definitely see many examples throughout the course. So that's something that will require some practice if you have to write it on your own, right? or at least to read them uh, from the questions. And uh, some, of the quest uh, some of the description, you may decide to have a third cell over here. And this part over here is for the traceability of your constraint. 
and this part over here is for tracing the E or R description. So not, not just that the uh, e, uh, e description can really have the third cell, but just in this example, we uh, for every requirements constraint over here, we don't have the third cell, but in, in general, definitely you can if you want to, right? So tracing the E or R description in the model. That's something you will definitely see. For example, you can see this one here. Let's read it together. We say, see the carrier set. We'll see what the carrier set is when I get to row them. See the carrier sets in the context. CXT is the abbrevi uh, abbreviated form for context, C0, right? So this is telling you that if you want to see how this particular environmental constraint is reflected in the model, you have to go to some carrier set in context zero. That's basically like for you to trace uh, from informal into formal, right? It's also very important uh, stuff for you to actually realize, all right? Let's now go back to the requirements to finish off the requirements documents. And we got, uh, you can think about requirements, usually it's about either functionality that we have to support and plus the properties that the system must satisfy. And here, when we talk about properties, those properties wouldn't just uh, come out for free. We have to prove them. As opposed to the axioms for the environmental constraint in this category, that's something we can assume because that's beyond our control. On the other hand, the properties over here are completely within our control because the only uh, whether or not the properties are provable or can be discharged depends on how we construct the model, which we'll see, right? I'm gonna show you some several examples throughout the video, uh, throughout the series of tutorial to see how we can make a small change of the model and suddenly some property may not be proved anymore. And if I, by making another change, maybe everything can be provable, right? That's something I wanna show you as well. Let's now take a look at the different requirements quickly. They're rather straightforward because it's a simple uh, bank system. We should allow a new account to be opened and the balance of a newly opened account is zero, right? It definitely specifies uh, like more like an instruction about how uh, what exactly the initial balance should be. But over here, it says it's zero, right? And then we should be uh, allow a new account to be open. There's also some functionality we want to support to open some account, right? And also allow the deposit of some money into an account. And also allow the withdrawal of some money from an account. However, you can see requirement themselves uh, sometimes may be incomplete, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, but after all, they are just uh, written documents using natural language like English. And there's something I can actually uh, warn you about, which we'll definitely handle in the model. Whenever we want to say deposit, that means we want to plus some money into the account. And is there any constraint uh, on the uh, deposit? Well, indeed, because remember, we actually talk about the preset upper bound, right, for each account, for any account. So you have to uh, say it's a uh, subject to, to the uh, preset amount L, all right? That's something you gotta be careful. Exactly how we should really handle it, we'll see. And also similarly, for the withdrawal of some money over here, we also have to, well, that means we wanna minus some amount from the balance of the account. In that case, it will be subject to the credit limit C, because you can see for this part over here, we want to make sure it does not go below the credit limits. And similarly, when you do uh, deposit, you, want, you don't want it, want it to go beyond the uh, uh, preset value L. But rather than considering just minus uh, 100 uh, or uh, 500, we want to consider just C and also L, abstractly, all right? All right, final two requirements, keep track of the bank's total. The total, uh, uh, well, and we call the bank's total something called uh, cash, uh, the cash draw, right? So basically the total amount of money that's available in the bank for uh, at any time, uh, that would more like an aggregated sum from all the accounts uh, balance. That's something we will have to maintain as well, okay? And also the bank's total shall always be non-negative over here, right? That's also another, uh, property that uh, this is so this will be some property that we have to actually uh prove eventually so this will be some property right by the way non-negative what does that mean that means not the case less than zero 
which means larger than or equal to zero. By the way, right? You can, you sh this is like an informal uh, sketch of what that really means. You should really be able to formulate what's really written in the natural language as much as possible. All right. And final, uh, let me mention one more point over here. So whenever we talk about our, this, uh, our properties, right? In the requirements category, if we talk about some property, most likely there will be some theorem that you will have to prove as opposed to axioms, which you can assume, right? You know, mathematically, the difference between axioms and theorems. Axioms are simply assumed without a proof. And the theorems over here are, should be proved. Uh, how about to prove? To prove using, in the simple case, just the axioms, which we assume to be true. And or other theorems, which we'll see, maybe not in this current tutorial, but maybe later uh, in the course, when we get more advanced. All right. It's a very detailed uh, walkthrough, just about exactly the problem that we're trying to solve and that we are learning about new concept as well. Let me recap very briefly, okay? We talk about requirements documents, which can be divided into two kinds of descriptions, either E description for environmental constraint, or R descriptions for the requirements itself, which usually consist of functionality to implement and also the property to be satisfied. And when you talk about the uh, Boolean conditions, either in this context or in this context, they should be dealt with differently. Whenever you talk about some Boolean constraint, usually they should be axioms in the case of uh, e-descriptions. When you talk about some Boolean constraint over here, usually there should be some properties you want to prove as a theorem. That's something we'll see when we construct the model. All right, so that's about the uh, introduction to the bank system that we want to model for the rest of the tutorial. And let's now go ahead and start.